All right, well, listen, uh, let me just make sure I record it. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, or good evening, depending upon where you're living. And uh, I want to take the opportunity today to share with you my personal experience of sudden deafness. Um, about three years ago, almost three years ago, I was uh, subjected to losing my hearing in my right ear. And since then, 30 days ago, I got a cochlear implant on my right side. So this is gonna kind of be a story of my personal journey. Um, having been an otolaryngologist for 30 years, and probably for the last 20 specializing in otology. I had absolutely no idea what it was like to really be deaf, let alone have a hearing loss. So I hope that my personal experiences will help you as physicians to better understand your patients because Hearing loss is a real phenomenon. And until you experience it, it's like going to the bakery and choosing any pastry you want and eating it and not even worrying. But until you lose your taste and the pastry doesn't taste good, you have no idea what you're missing. So with that said, I'd like to start the lecture. I think a good place to start would be with this journal article. It's the clinical guidelines. It's the 2019 update. And it's probably the most comprehensive piece of literature out there today with respect to sudden hearing loss. Uh, if any of you need it, please feel free to email me. It's readily available on the internet. Google the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Sudden Hearing Loss Guidelines. I believe they originally came out in 2012, and this is the update. And pretty much, I'm gonna just summarize it for you. Um, they recommend oral steroids, if available, transtympanic membrane steroids. If you have access to hyperbaric oxygen, that's fine. But I think it's a still a very controversial subject whether or not hyperbaric oxygen will help. Um, it's sure not gonna hurt you. It's gonna put the oxygen concentration in the blood delivered to the cochlea at a much higher concentration. And whether or not hypoxia is one of the etiologies for the hearing loss um, would be a debatable in light of not knowing the diagnosis. They do not recommend or promote vasodilators, antivirals, or thrombolytics, unless the history, unless the history dictates that that would be an appropriate treatment modality. So what is waking up death and what is sudden central hearing loss? This is a, a commonly used criterion to qualify this diagnosis is a sensory neural hearing loss greater than 30 decibels over three contiguous pure tone frequencies occurring within a three day period. Well, let's put it this way. That is a, that is a definition, okay? Your patient's not gonna say, Doctor, I came in, I got 2,000, 4,000, and 6,000 hertz, uh, and I've dropped you know, 30 decibels in each of those frequency ranges. Uh, it happened in three days. No, your patient's going to come into your office, or your friend's going to tell you, or you're going to hear a story from somebody, and they're going to say, my friend went deaf. He lost his hearing, or she lost her hearing. And the most important thing to realize is that there's variations in how much hearing is lost. But to follow the criteria of sudden hearing loss, it's usually a 30 decibel change from the normal 
hearing of the individual. And what are some of the statistics? Well, I thought it'd be interesting to look at, these are the statistics for sudden hearing loss. There's about 14 cases per 100,000 people. And I said, well, what's the closest thing to hearing loss? And it's blindness. There's approximately twice as many people a year that go blind as do people going deaf. There's about 27 per 100,000. In the United States alone, there's well over 4,000 people that go deaf a year, worldwide in excess of 15,000. And the age group of individuals is mostly 50 to 60 year olds, okay? Um, the cause for sudden hearing loss even after workups that are quite extensive, it still comes back to idiopathic. We don't know. Fortunately, only about 2% are bilateral. Male to female, it's about equal. And associated symptoms, associated symptoms with the hearing loss, it's about 20 to 40% will have some form of vertigo as one of the presenting symptoms and tinnitus in about 60 to 70%. Now, when I presented, I had the following scenario. It was Saturday morning. It was in Los Angeles at a Temple Bone course in University of Southern California. I flew back to my house the next day, uneventful. That Sunday when I was home, I did notice some fluctuations, uh, excuse me, on Monday, I noticed like some fluctuations in my hearing. It was, it was like, I thought maybe I had eustachian tube dysfunction. I took some dexamethasone and then went to sleep. The next morning on Tuesday, I woke up and I couldn't hear out of my right ear. It was basically dead. Uh, I went to the audiologist who I know, did an audiogram, and it showed a significant hearing loss in that ear. And by that afternoon, I had gotten my first trans tympanic steroid injection. And over the following three weeks, I had two more injections. So here is my audiogram. You can see the right ear, my right ear, I have a high frequency loss. I use a standard hearing aid on that. Excuse me, on my left ear, I use a standard hearing aid to compensate for the high frequency losses. But if you look at my right ear, I'm down at 90 decibels all the way to about 2000. And then I'm at about 70 decibels. The most important thing to realize here is that, um, <laughs> The profound hearing loss that developed in my left ear, had I not had a fun, had had I not had a ability to hear out of my left ear, I would be really in a bad situation. So, what are what were some of my symptoms before my cochlear implant? Well, I completely lost the hearing on my right ear. And when you lose hearing, you'll commonly find that patients feel like their body is split in half. And that's exactly what I did. It was like nothing was happening on my right side, even with a high powered hearing aid. And I tried cross hearing aids. I tried high powered single sided hearing aids and neither one of those really helped me very much. Sound localization completely lost the ability to differentiate where sound was coming from. I could hear a noise, but I didn't know where it was coming from, behind me, to the right, or to the left. Absolutely no idea. The other thing it feels like, it felt like there was fullness in my ear, as though, as though somebody stuck cotton in my ear oral fullness. Fortunately, 
I did not experience any vertigo, nor did I experience any tinnitus. However, over the next 24 months, I started developing in my right ear, I, did, I started developing tinnitus in my right ear. And we'll talk about tinnitus and how it helped was helped with the cochlear implant. The causative factors, well, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm deaf now. I am deaf in my right ear. Am I freaking out? No, but I know my life is definitely changing, okay? None of us know that our lives are definitely changing until we either die and we don't know about it or we develop a disability, be it one of our sensory systems, ability to walk, something changes in our life. And if you look at this graph, I think it's probably one of the most comprehensive um, graphs with respect to the etiology of single-sided deafness and asymmetric hearing loss. And you'll see that idiopathic made up 55%, unknown 16%. So you can clearly see, even after extensive workup, we do not know what the cause of sudden sentinel hearing loss is in close to 70, in, 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 in at least in this chart, 70%. Sure, we know patients have CPA lesions. They have schwannomas. Patients have had cholesteatomas who have dealt, developed labyrinthitis perilymphistula, head trauma, um, mumps. We know all those etiologies as a, a cause for hearing loss. They can cause sudden central hearing loss, but the majority of patients still, we do not know the cause. So I'm sitting here with really at this point in time, now three years later, not a defined etiology as to what was the cause for my, my hearing loss. When you think about the hearing loss, you have to develop, you have to divide it into cochlear and retrocochlear. Sure, we've got infections, head trauma, vascular events, hematologic phenomena, ototoxicity, we know that Meniere's disease over a prolonged period of time can cause deafness, metabolic issues such as diabetes, thyroid disorders, and the newest frontiers are autoimmune diseases. But again, you'll be able to assess whether or not it's a cochlear or retrocochlear lesion by taking the patient's history. And then we go to retrocochlear. Does it, you know, you're gonna know if your patient had meningitis or encephalitis. Multiple sclerosis as well can show a retrocochlear pathology causing sensor neuro hearing loss. Uh, metastatic tumors. Um, and we talked about schwannomas, chordomas, and cerebellar pontine lesions. But we let's talk about idiopathic. And this is a category that I fall into. And again, now we're talking the science of the hearing loss. And there's various hypotheses. There's four main ones. And one is a viral hypothesis. Still to this day, it's more or less circumstantial. In a non-controlled study that was recently done, anywhere from 30, 17 to 33% of those that developed hearing loss said that they had a recent viral illness. Now, again, from our perspective as physicians, what is a viral illness? A upper respiratory tract infection, a mild cold, a pneumonia, sinusitis. If indeed these patients had that, what really is the association of the so-called viral illness and is it the precipitating factor for the hearing loss? And histologic studies show cochlear damage consistent with viral injury 
which we have seen in measles, mumps, and rubella. The vascular hypothesis is that the cochlea is an end organ. There's no doubt about it. It has no collateral blood supply. If you don't deliver blood to the cochlea and the labyrinth, it's a, the organ dies. This can come from thrombosis, embolism, or spasm. And as this happens, we alter the oxygen tension in the perilymph and the end organ, which is the organ of cordy dies. And the other possibility is that hypercholesterol, even in one study, it showed um, a 1.62 times increase factor in a study of 74,000 patients in China, that there was an association between hypercholesterol and sudden deafness. Another theory is a membrane rupture, the intercochlear membrane rupture. The perilymph and the endolymph mix. One is high in potassium, the other sodium. And these changes change the, these changes in the fluids, the electrolyte composition affects the endocochlear potential. And these, this theory was kind of favored by Goodhill. I think he was from San Francisco, Victor Goodhill or UCLA and then Simons. And the last one is autoimmune. This is our most recent concept for sudden hearing loss, more or less introduced in the 1979, uh, more clearly defined as a sensor neuro hearing loss, which is progressive, sudden, unclear. And we've seen the, there's two models that, fu that fall into this category, Kogan syndrome and systemic lupus erythematosus. But when we get down to it, look at the pathway here, okay? Here we have a coronal CT. And if you look at it, the auditory pathway is very extensive and complex. We start here with our cochlea, the cochlear nerve going to the cochlear nucleus. It, the fibers decussate to the opposite side going to the olivary complex, lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body, and the auditory cortex. It's an extensive pathway. A lesion at any site within the pathway will cause hearing loss. Fortunately, let me go back, I'm sorry. Fortunately, we have developed cochlear implants and brainstem implants. And in February, Dr. Wilkinson is going to talk about brainstem implants. He used to be at the House Ear Clinic and now he's in, he's in Boise, Idaho. And he went over to Europe to Verona, Italy, where Dr. Coletti, who's a pioneer in auditory brain implants, um, works. So we should have a really interesting discussion about that at the, in, in February. But you can see here that, you know, once we leave almost the, once we leave the cochlear nucleus, at this point in time, in terms of research and patient rehabilitation, we can't do very much. So what happens? depending upon the etiology. And again, we went through four different theories. The ultimate phenomena is that we lose the organ of Cordy. And if you look here, this is a normal, this is the normal organ of Cordy. All right. You can see that the tectorial membrane, scale of vestibula, media, and tympani. Here, we have complete loss of the cortical or the organ of cordy hair cells and the supporting structures as a result of whatever the insult was that caused the hearing loss. The organ of cordy literally, literally disintegrates. And over a longer period of time, we'll see loss of the peripheral process here 
Okay. And we'll see loss of the nucleus, spiral ganglion nucleus within Rosenthal's canal. So this is exactly what happens. This is what my ear looks like. I have no organ of cordy anymore. And an interesting phenomenon is that in amphibians and avians, they can regenerate they can regenerate the organ of Corti. They have their DNA and their genetic code allows for them to regenerate the organ of Corti if they have no, if they have had undergone a traumatic event. So fish and birds have a unique capability. As of this time of, as of this time in, in the history of, you know, hearing loss, we have not broken the, the code to be able to help activate the regeneration of or the organ of cordy. Oops. So here's a histologic section of the same thing. This is the normal ear, organ of cordy, tectorial membrane. We've completely lost it. Completely lost organ of cordy. We have degeneration of the peripheral process and the spiral nucleus ganglion here. And here, this histologic section I thought was interesting because it's, it's showing a selective hearing loss. At this turn of the cochlea, we have no organ of corti, so there will be a hearing loss at this level, whereas at this level, we still have the organ of corti. So the patient comes in. So what happened to me? Well, I knew a little more than most people because of my profession. And I knew what happened. And I knew what I needed to do. So the history, I said to myself, well, what happened? Did I get exposed to a virus in the temporal bone lab or something? And it, a latent virus in some, some, you know, it's possible. I mean, it, it's, it's possible. I would have had to gone back and, you know, cultured every bone that I touched to see if there was a latent virus. Well, I didn't do that because it wouldn't have been fruitless because I had already had the, the traumatic event. I lost my hearing. Um, did I do blood work? No, I didn't do any blood work at all. I didn't do ANA, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. I didn't test myself for syphilis, didn't test my, my thyroid. Um, had there been a good reason, I would have done that. But I did do a MRI originally because anywhere from one to 2% of the people who develop sudden hearing loss will have a CPA angle tumor. And fortunately my MRI was negative as are most MRIs in patients who develop sudden hearing loss. And I went on as well to do a CT scan of the cochlea and temporal bone um, strictly for the purpose of future implantation. Now, another thing that's really important to know is anywhere from three to 13% of patients with acoustic neuromas also present with sudden sense of neurohearing loss. So, my whole workup was basically the MRI to rule out any kind of retrocochlear pathology, CT scan to, to make sure that the anatomy of my temporal bone was normal. And after waiting patiently, I finally got a opportunity to see a friend of mine who is a neurotologist. Now I had gone, I have numerous friends that are neurotologists. I consulted with every single one of them. And um, ultimately I decided to get a cochlear implant. Everything was done virtual. I didn't see the doctor until my first audiology consultation. We talked for a few minutes. And then the next time I saw him was as they were putting propothal in my vein and I was getting my implant. So basically before surgery, other than for the CT scan and the MRI, 
I took a Prevnar 13 pneumococcal vaccine to prevent post-operative meningitis and I had my implant. So here's my CT scan. This is the axial CT scan. You can see basal turnocochlea. You can see the round window, round window niche. You can see the mid portion of the cochlea and the apex. So my temporal bone CT was completely normal. Here you can see the coronal view, completely normal cochlea. And here you can see a parasagittal. So there was no reason not to get implanted. My main problem was that I felt still, even with the hearing aid in my left ear, which has a sensor neuro hearing loss, that the, I needed to hear better. I wanted to hear better. And I didn't want that feeling like my body was split in half. So I had the opportunity to choose my implant. I feel unbelievably fortunate to be able to have had an implant. You know, we hear stories about all these children who don't even have, you know, prelingual deafness, you know, um, and they, m many of them don't have the opportunity. Um, I just feel really honored to be able to have one. So there's four major companies, Cochlear, Medel, Advanced Bionics, and Oticon. There's some other Chinese startups like Neurotron, but these four are the main companies. Now, again, depending upon the program you go to or where you have this done, um, they might make you lean towards one or another. I was not, nobody made me lean towards one or another. I chose Cochlear because the fact that I travel, they have a better um, established network um, for troubleshooting. Uh, Advanced Bionics, I stayed away from because they had a major recall on electrodes recently. Uh, I did not even consider Medalver to tell you the truth. So I have a cochlear, what's called a Nucleus 7. Now, you have to think of a cochlear implant on simplistic terms. Think of it almost like a hearing aid. The difference is that we are taking analog sound, converting it to digital sound, and sending that sound down a wire to stimulate an electrode that's in the cochlea. And there's really, there's really only four parts to this. They're not complex, okay? And one is the processor. Basically, it looks like a large hearing aid, sits on top of the ear, and this has microphones in it. It processes the analog sound, transmits it via a little wire to a transmitter. And this transmitter will attach to your scalp via the magnet. It transmits to an internal receiver, which the receiver and the electrode are one component. And then in the cochlea, you have your electrode array. There's different types of electrodes. There's lateral wall electrodes, there's dilated electrodes, there's 22 um, array electrodes, 32 array electrodes. Depending upon, and I have don't have enough you know, knowledge about electrode selection. Um, I chose a CI622 electrode uh, the CI622 is a 22 array electrode. It's the most common electrode used in the um, cochlear family of uh, electrodes. And they recently came out with a what's called the Canzo. Now this is the processor. Instead of wearing a large device over the ear, you just wear this device, which is the processor. You can see the microphones here and the processor just attaches via a magnet. Now, the most important thing is that if you're gonna use this device, usually you need to wait 
I'm 30, I'm just going to be 30 days out from surgery in, uh, in two more days. I'm 28 days from surgery. And I have this device called the Canzo. Um, this is what it looks like. All right. This is a safety cord. You put it on your lapel here so that if it falls, it doesn't hit the ground. This device has a magnet on it. There's six different powers of magnets. Depending, I have the highest power magnet and I can only wear this late in the afternoon because there's still swelling underneath the scalp here. So the more swelling there is, the less it's able to maintain its fixation uh, magnetically. But hopefully in the next month, I'll be able to wear this permanently. So what happens for implantation? First of all, yes, there's an extensive amount of audiologic testing that's done. And my main problem was that if I wasn't wearing the hearing aid on my left ear, my speech discrimination was 10%. I couldn't understand anything. So after an extensive evaluation uh, and testing, the office submitted a report to the insurance company, which approved it on the first petition for implantation. And I'm unbelievably surprised that it was that smooth. So once it was approved, then an outpatient surgery took about an hour and a half. Um, by the time you get in, put asleep, facial nerve monitor hooked up, um, a simple mastoidectomy with facial recess approach and a implantation via the round window, implantation of the electrode, and then closure. You're looking at about an hour and a half. Seven days after surgery, I went back and I was activated. What is the activation? Activation is where the audiologist will now send electrical stimulation to the electrode array in your cochlea. So I hadn't heard for almost three years. And then all of a sudden she turns this thing on and I'm hearing like an ocean sound, like shh, shh, shh. That's exactly the sound I heard. She did that. She went through the various electrodes activating them all. All of my electrodes were activated. They're all functional. And she has the capability if there's interference between various electrodes to shut one off or not. Because when you get interference on the electrodes, you get what's like, I guess the simplest thing is R2D2 voice. Um, if you ever have seen Star Wars, the R2D2 is like that robot and he makes an, his voice is like very animated. So I can't produce the R2-D2 voice, but if you get on YouTube, I'm sure you'll hear it. So I got activated a week out. I went back a week later, she once the activation and she started programming it. So I am now at almost 30 days and I'm going back in a week to get reprogrammed. And what happens is after the 30 day pro 30 day reevaluation, 180 and then 360. And then as needed. This is more or less what she had. This is the audiologist. She has a computer. Everything is Bluetooth. You sit there and she's manipulating your hearing, what you're hearing. And she's going through each of the different electro arrays. She's stimulating them, activating them and programming them. And you can, she'll make you listen to certain sounds. She will adjust the decibel level and sensitivity of each array according to what you answer in terms of her questions. So she'll sit there at every setting and work 
off a computer monitor and try to adjust the cochlear implant so that it is able to present digital sound to each of the different arrays in the cochlea such that you can have audible, audible speech. And here's a perfect example. This is a CI-622 going through the round window. And it's very important when the array goes into the cochlea that you do not damage the modiolus because if you have any residual hearing, you wanna to try to preserve that. So there's certain electrode arrays, there's called the lateral wall, which means it's gonna hang on the lateral wall of the two and a half turns of the cochlea, not touching or damaging as best as possible. Now, again, we're not seeing what we're doing we do know that we have a little fistula here we created through the round window membrane, but we're not seeing the electrode array go in until at the end of the case, we take a simple x-ray to confirm that the electrode is in the cochlea. We're not visualizing its insertion. It's all done by feel. And this is ultimately what we will, we will see. This is a Here's the 20th electrode, 21, 22. Okay, and this would be the basilar turn of the cochlea here, the apical turn there. And again, the audiologists will adjust and calibrate each electrode according to our responses to her questions. So what happened after my implant compared to before my implant? Well, here's the first thing hearing. Before hearing, without the cochlear implant, my ear was dead. I might have been able to hear some very high frequencies, but essentially my hearing was non-serviceable and non-functional. Post-implantation, I would say that I can understand probably 20 to 30% of the words now that I hear. I'm, it, was, it, it, it was nothing more than amazing to me. And I am, I'm even, I've got six months of, of further work and rehabilitation. When I say rehabilitation, there are audible sounds that you can listen to on the internet and try to reprogram your mind and the neural pathways. You have to realize when we go deaf, two things happen. Those neuronal pathways that used to function for sound transmission have been dormant. They haven't been activated for however long a period it is that the individual has been deaf. So it's called plasticity. We have to redevelop the ability to transmit sound along that long pathway to the auditory cortex. We're regenerating nerves. We're regenerating neurotransmitters. We're rebuilding neurons. There's a huge amount of development in our brain, brainstem that is, is, is undergoing reprocessing. The feeling of half a body, that feeling is really gone now. Even at one month period, I feel like I'm centered now. Centered in that, centered in that, I don't feel like my body's only half there. Sound localization, it's definitely improving. I took a walk with my dog this morning we're outside, we live on a prairie, and I could hear his collar, you just heard it as well. I could hear him in the background and I kept walking straight. I paid close attention to the sound that was being delivered to my ear through my implant and my hearing aid. And I said, okay, he's gonna come up on my right side. And he did come up on my right side because I was able to identify where sound was coming from. And again, 
I'm only 30 days out. Oral fullness, I don't have that anymore. As a matter of fact, when I don't have my cochlear implant on, I feel very uncomfortable. I feel like my ears full, like there's a pillow on my head. It's, it's uncomfortable. I need the stimulation. I need the electrical input to feel more balanced. Vertigo, okay, vertigo. Now this is something that is a known phenomena. About a week after the surgery, I started developing imbalance. Like I get up out of bed and I'd feel like I just got off a boat. It lasted for four or five days. Uh, consulted with everybody who I know and I started some high dose steroids. Okay, I took dexamethasone, eight milligrams twice a day and I tapered it off over a week's period of time. I haven't taken steroids for five days now. My vertigo is all gone. I do not have any persistent vertigo. Um, I feel like my feet are on the ground. I do not feel like I am um, having any difficulty at all. Uh, tinnitus. Now here's, here's an interesting thing. Originally when I went deaf, had no problem. I didn't have any ringing in my ear. I'm talking about the right ear. And then about six months ago, I started developing tinnitus. M most people will consider, I'll, I'll call it white noise. It's a low frequency sound like that. It interferes with your brain. It interferes with most people if it's loud enough and, and persistent. The tinnitus, when your blood pressure goes up, when anxiety goes up, and when you're tired gets worse. So I was having persistent tinnitus. I could tolerate it. I didn't like it, but I could tolerate it. One of the things about cochlear implants is that it has a significant impact on the tinnitus that people experience pre-implantation. I would say that three days after surgery, my tinnitus went away. I have not experienced any tinnitus since implantation whatsoever. And this is a really another phenomenon that's, that I'm really happy about. So to summarize what's happened, tinnitus is gone, oral fullness is gone. I'm developing sound localization, half a body feeling, not there anymore. And I can hear out of my ear. It's going to take six to nine months before I can say, I don't even realize it's a cochlear implant. I do realize now because of the R2-D2 voice, you know, that, that kind of artificial voice. This is just what I, uh, you know, for, for the dizziness, I took the dexamethasone, as I said. There's a host of vestibular exercises as well. Um, horizontal head movement, saccad, visual tracking, and then focusing while turning. Uh, I didn't really do them. I do have the brochure on it if anybody's interested. So being that what it is, that is my experience so far with uh, a cochlear implant. Um, as I said to you be before, um, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to have had a cochlear implant. It's, uh, uh, it's changed my life in 30 days. I think I'm happier. Um, I definitely realize there's a long, long journey ahead, but, uh, you know, I probably could have survived without it, but the quality of life wouldn't have been as good. And, um, I guess, you know, it's unfortunate that, uh, we can't offer everybody who has, you know, hearing loss, especially the young children, um, who are born prelingual, you know, who have prelingual deafness, because if you look at YouTube videos, you'll see these kids that are like, like these one and two year old kids that never spoke before, or heard a sound before. And like they, they laugh, they freak out because now they can hear. And uh, all I can say is 
we, we have a great profession. We have the opportunity to help people. And if it's there and you can give them the, the opportunity to get a improvement in their hearing, then, you know, all I would say is go for it. But unfortunately, the implant is very expensive. And when you think about a cochlear implant, compared to your cell phone, um, it's an unfortunate thing that this thing costs $600 and the implant's $25,000. Um, just the way it is. There's so much more technology in the cell phone than there is in the cochlear implant. And the other thing is, there's I have two apps. I have an app for my cochlear implant and I have an app for my hearing aid. Both of them are streamable. Unfortunately, they're not streamable on the same channel. So what I'm gonna prime up, probably wind up doing is getting a resound hearing aid instead of an Oticon hearing aid because the resound hearing aids Bluetooth on the same channel as do the, your cochlear implant. And what I can do with, I I'm not, I can't show you everything. Uh, oh, here, we'll try it in demo mode. Okay, here's the demo mode. You can see this, you can change the volume. Okay, you can change the um, program and you can Bluetooth. If you look here, when you get a cochlear implant, you get a backpack and you get a ton of stuff here a ton of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of exploring it. There's what's called a TV streamer where you can hook your TV up to a box and then it will Bluetooth to your cochlear implant. There are microphones you can wear here. There are devices that protect it from water. Uh, there's there's a host of things. I mean, it's, it's like learning a uh, something completely new that you never even knew existed. So anyway, I thought that uh, my firsthand experience with cochlear implantation would be of value to some of you. Like I say, until you have, until it happens to you, and I hope God bless you, none of you ever have it happen, but it seems like uh, we're, we're not the ones who are calling the shots here anymore. You know, there's a higher power and you know, we're just here for the journey. Um, but uh, like I say, I think it's a, it's a unbelievable tool to help people. Um, and uh, if anybody has any questions, please ask me and I'll be glad to make a comment if I can. Well, if nobody has any questions, then I will say thank you for listening to my lecture today. Um, next week, we have Thomas from Lithuania, who's going to talk about education in Lithuania. And um, we we'll look forward to hearing from him. In the meantime, if any of you want the uh, American Academy article, please reach out to me. Otherwise, have a pleasant week, and it's nice seeing everybody. Okay. Take care and be well.